Oh God, I help in ages past. I hope for years to come. A bless shelter from the stormy blast. I eternal home stands I want everybody. For years to come, a shelter from the stormy blast. Uh, oh. Large auditorium, I cannot hear you. Sans I want everybody. Oh, God, I help you in ages past. I hope for years to come. A shelter from the stormy blast and a eternal home under the shadow thy throne still me will dwell secure so patient is thine arm alone and a defense is sure before the hill seen order stood or received a frame from everlasting thou art God to endless years the same An ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. In ages past, I hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while life shall last. Amen. Some of you didn't uh, attend the Anglican church before you came, so you don't know that song. Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for this study tonight. We glorify your name because you brought us together to study your word. We're praying, Lord, that your word will enrich our lives even tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you grant every one of us a spirit of understanding and make your word profitable for everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all be seated. We're now in our study in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. The Lord has been leading us and has led us through chapters 1 through to 6. Revelation chapter 7 actually is like an interlude, a parenthesis. That means a period of calm and protection in the midst of divine fury and wrath. This is a chapter that comes between the opening and the demonstration of the sixth seal and the opening and the demonstration of the seventh seal. The sixth seal, in the sixth seal, we found that at the end of chapter 6, there was calamity on the earth that the people recognized this is a day of God's wrath. 
And then in chapter 8, you'll find another thing happening. In fact, it will be so serious, there'll be silence in heaven for about half an hour. Between the two, that is between the beginning of sorrows and the beginning of the great and the final tribulation, we have this chapter which reveals the sealing, the security, the preservation, the protection of some redeemed, saved, righteous Jews, Israelites who belong to God. But we need to remember something. That there are two major purposes of the great tribulation. If you don't understand the purposes of the great tribulation, you may not understand why we have chapter 7 here as a parenthesis between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. What are the two purposes of the great tribulation? Number one is to pour out judgment upon the sinful, unbelieving world. On the other hand, we have the second purpose, and it is to prepare the nation of Israel for the Messiah, turning them away from ungodliness that they had had since the time of the old covenant. Look at the first purpose, which is to pour out judgment on the sinful, unbelieving world. In Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 6, Isaiah Chapter 13, reading from verse 6. How will ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every heart shall melt. And they, that sh and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travelleth. They shall be amazed one at another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. You can tell then that during that time of the great tribulation, it will be a time of the visitation of the wrath of God, of the anger of God, the judgment of God, the fury of God upon this unbelieving sinful world. It tells us in verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in their going forth, and the moon shall not cause a light to shine. If you've been with us in our studies, you'll know that that happened at the time of the breaking of the sixth seal that the sun was darkened and the moon turned to blood and the mountains were shifted from where they were and the people were running helter skelter wanting the mountains and the rocks to fall on them because they realized the day of the wrath of God has come and who shall be able to stand in verse 11 I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked and the wicked for their iniquity I will destroy will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. It shows so very clearly then that the time of the great tribulation will be the time of pouring out the wrath of God, the judgment of God upon the unbelieving world. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21. Here is the same thing that we are told, telling us the purpose of God during that time of the great tribulation. Chapter 26 and verse 21. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. For their iniquity, the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. But the second purpose is that Israel might be turned to the Messiah. And that the Lord will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In fact, from the very first time that God revealed that there will be a great tribulation. The children of Israel were told that in that great tribulation, they will cry upon the Lord. They will cry to the Lord and the Lord will deliver them. Look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading verses 30 and 31. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things shall come upon thee, even in the latter days, which means that the tribulation that the Lord was prophesying or predicting here, revealing here, wasn't all the troubles they went through in the Old Testament. It's saying, during the latter days, if thou shalt turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice for the lord thy god is a merciful god he will not forsake thee neither destroy thee nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which is where unto them you understand 
then that during the time of the great tribulation, the children of Israel will remember that the purpose of the great tribulation for them is to turn them away from their sin and to turn them to the Lord. And as they call upon the Lord, they will be saved. In Jeremiah chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 30, he's still talking about the time of the great tribulation and then he talks about the salvation of the children of Israel, even during that time of the great tribulation. Jeremiah 30 verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear and of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned to paleness alas for the day is great so that none is like it even it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a great tribulation. For a time for the people of Israel. And they are referred to as Israel or Jacob. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Listen to this. But he shall be saved out of it. Which means then at that time. When the great tribulation will strike. There will be mercy for the children of Israel. We are told in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 13. In Zechariah chapter 13. Again telling us that although it will be a troublous time. A time of tribulation. And a time of great trouble those children of Israel they will receive mercy from the Lord Zechariah 13 chapter 13 verse 1 in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness and it shall come to pass in that day says the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered. And also, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Look at verse 8. And shall come to pass that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. That's a great tribulation. Two, two thirds of the population of the children of Israel, they will be cut off and die. And you remember the first seal and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. You remember that there will be a false peace. You remember there will be a war and there will be famine and there will be pestilence. There will be death and hell following after. And then there will be the vengeance of the Lord coming upon the people. And then there will be that, all the mountains moving and the islands moving. And then the people that are rich, they will be casting all their riches in onto the birds and onto the idol all the idols into the rocks and he'll say rock fall on us at that time two thirds of the children of israel will be cut off and they will die but the third shall be left therein and i will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and it shall call on my name you see that during that time of the great tribulation when they see the judgment the devastation the destruction the calamities coming upon them the children of israel they will call upon the name of the lord and i will hear them and i will say it is my people and they shall say the lord is my God. We're told in, in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, this is why the spirit, where the Spirit of God revealed that the Lord will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, from the people of Israel at that time. In Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. That is after those who have died would have died. After those who have suffered the great tribulation and their perish and two thoughts are cut off, the remaining part, the residue, they will be saved. All the Israelites remaining, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob the deliverer. That's the savior. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus Christ whom they have rejected now. At that time, they'll be looking for him and they'll be praying to God, send the Messiah now. We're sorry for what we have done for rejecting him. I will pour the spirit of supplication and grace upon the house of David. And then in verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away 
their sins. So then we understand the two purposes of the great tribulation. Number one, to pour out the judgment, the fury, and the wrath of God upon the unbelieving one. Number two, to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Which means then that many in Israel, and many among those Jews all over the world, of course even many among the Gentile nations will be saved during the great tribulation. We need to resolve a question here now. Because there is a problem in the heart of many people who do not understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They ask the question, will the Holy Spirit, the divine agent in conversion and in regeneration, will he not be removed from the world at the time of the rapture of the church? That you'll find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Yes, he will be removed in a particular sense. If he will be removed from the world at that time, how can anyone be saved during the great tribulation? The answer is this. The Holy Spirit, the restrainer, will be removed only in the sense that he came in a unique way on the day of Pentecost. But you know he's omnipresent. He's present every time and everywhere. Don't you find the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament before the uh, great day of Pentecost came? Yes, you'll find him in the Old Testament. What did David say? Take not thy free spirit away from me. What did Micah say? I am full of the power of the Holy Spirit. What did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And what do you read in Zechariah? It says, not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Which means then, as you look at the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was present, mightily present, in the Old Testament. Only that on the day of Pentecost, he came in a very special way, in a very unique way. Now, at the time of the rapture, the church will go from the earth and the Holy Spirit will be taken away from the earth as the restrainer. In a special way, he would have gone, but his presence will still be felt and he still continue his work. That means then during the great tribulation, after the rapture, there will still be people getting saved. Both Jews and Gentiles will be saved during that time and many of them will die for their faith. And, but some will survive the fury of the great day and even be allowed to go into the millennial kingdom now the people that will be saved there are two groups of them one group jews the other group gentiles look at your bible now in revelation chapter 7 in Revelation chapter 7, we find in verse 2 and i saw another angel ascending from the east having the sea I mean the seal of the living God and uh, he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads who are those servants of our God in verse 4 and I had the number of them which was sealed and there was sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel on the one hand there will be one group that will be saved during that time and it will be of the children of Israel and he'll be sealed to be protected and to be preserved. And when they are preserved like that, the Antichrist will not be able to oppress them like uh, the Antichrist will oppress the rest of the people. But there's another group too that will be saved. This group, 144,000, those are the Jews. That's the first group. But there's a second group. Look at verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all the nations and the kindreds and the people and the tongues and stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which seated upon the throne and unto the lamb that's the second group and this one is a multitude who are these these are gentiles because it says they are from all kindreds and nations and people and tongues but then you notice there's something here there's a difference in the first group you have 144,000 and they're Jews and they're still here on the earth and they are preserved and protected and, and uh, they, are, they are covered and secured so that the Antichrist will not be able to hurt them 
this multitude of the Gentiles, there's no protection for them. They are killed during that great tribulation because it says they are before the throne and before the Lamb and they are clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Yes, Gentiles will be saved during the great tribulation. But as they suffer uh, the oppression and the attack and the affliction of the Antichrist during the great tribulation, they will lose their lives. They will not be protected like the Jews were protected. Therefore, if anybody is saying, well, since Jews will be saved at that time, I will wait for that time so that at that time I also will get saved. Well, you are going to suffer uh, the great tribulation and you will lose your life. Look at this. In verse 13, and one of the elders answered saying unto to me, what are these which are arranged in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. That is, they were in the great tribulation. And they killed, they, saw, they were killed, and they suffered, they were martyred for their faith. They came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We're studying the first group today, that is the Jews. We're looking at the 144,000 Jews that will be sealed and saved during the time of the great tribulation. We're looking at chapter 7 today, and we're looking at it from verses 1 through to 8. Look at your Bible. Revelation chapter 7 from verse 1. And after these things I saw, for angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor, the, nor, uh, nor on the sea, nor on, the tr on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hot not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there was sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah was sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben was sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad was sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher was sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000. And then now of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. You'll see that all this list is Jewish. These are the children of Israel. This is not the church. This is a special program for the people of Israel during the time of the Great Tribulation. I divide the study to three parts. Number one, the sealing and protection of God's Jewish people. The sealing, they were sealed. And a protection for preservation of God's Jewish servants. And then point number two, you have the selection of particular groups of Jehovah's servants. The selection of particular groups of Jehovah's servants. And then in point number three, we have salvation and purity of godly, justified saints. Let's come to number one, the sealing and the protection of God's Jewish people. As you look at it, starting from verse one, how do you understand verse one? It says, and after these things, what does that mean after these things? After the things recorded in chapter six. After the coming out of all those uh, horses, uh, the white horse and the red horse and the black horse and the pale horse and the devastation that came in chapter 6. After these things, after the opening and the execution of the sixth seal, when the mountains began to move and the people were crying to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand after these things? Do you realize the question that has come out at the end of chapter 6? Who shall be able to stand? The meaning is, who shall be able to endure? The meaning is, who shall be able to escape? The meaning is, who shall be preserved during that time of the great tribulation with everything moving and with the devastation that is taking place? And chapter 7 gives us the answer to that. Who shall be able to stand? There are some people that will be able to stand. 
There are some people that will escape. There are some people that will endure. There are some people that will be preserved by the power of the Lord. And that's the revelation the Lord is giving us here in answer to the question, who shall be able to stand? And then it says, after these things I saw, four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. When it says the four corners of the earth, you said, what's the meaning of that? I thought the earth is not rectangular. I thought the earth does not have corners because it's like a ball. It's like a globe. Yes, we know that. But you know that we're talking about north and south and east and west. How many do you have there? That, that, that's four. The four corners of the earth is referring to the north and the south and the east and the west. It says, I see those angels and they were standing in the east, in the west, in the north, in the south, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth and on the sea and on any tree. Ah, you see, if the wind does not blow on the earth, what's going to be the situation of the people that live on the earth? How shall they breathe? You don't understand when it says the winds should not blow. Look at this in uh, Jeremiah chapter 49. In Jeremiah chapter 49, we're looking at it from verse 36. Jeremiah Chapter 49, verse 36. And upon Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. I will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no nation whither the outcast of Elam shall not come. And I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies. And before, they, and before them shall, they shall see, they seek their, that seek their lives. I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, says the Lord. And I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from thence the king and the princes, says the Lord. The wind here is symbolic. It's talking about the wind of judgment. You see, when the seventh seal is broken, there will be devastation again, calamity again, and problems again. And then that wind of judgment that will blow at the opening of the seventh seal, the Lord is saying, stop it for now. Hold it for now. Hold on. Don't allow that wind of judgment to blow now until the servants of the Lord are sealed. That's why I began by telling you that this is a, a moment of calm, parenthesis, a time that the people had a breathing space so that the judgment of God will be suspended at that time. And then after the judgment has been suspended and the people of God, that is the children of Israel, they have been sealed. Then the calamities will come again and the wind will be released. That is the wind of judgment and the wind of fury and the wind of devastation and the wind of calamities coming upon the earth at at that time. Come on to verse 2. Revelation chapter 7 verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. Having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth. Hold it now. Let there be calm. Let there be the suspension of the hurt of the judgment of the fury of the wrath of God. Hold on. Hot not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. It says, yes, the judgment will still come. The judgment will still continue. But you hold on until these people, 144,000 Jews, until they have been sealed. After the things described in the previous chapter, at the end of the opening of the sixth seal, the, this vision of the restraining of the winds of fury, the winds of judgment was revealed. At the end of chapter 6, there had been an awful, terrifying consternation and alarm, as if the end of the world had come. But now the winds are to be held back, and further judgments are to be delayed until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Four angels are to restrain the winds that blow from the four points of the compass, that is, from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. Between the opening of the sixth seal and the seventh seal, uh, there, there will be a brief period of universal calm, a state of profound quietness, symbolized by the holding back of the winds, the rising tempests and the storms, if unrestrained, will spread desolation in the whole world, but the impending ruin would be held back until God's children, and that is God's children, the children of Israel, until they are sealed. 
these are the just that is these are the people of god these people of god they will be sealed this god's servants a specified number and they are a peculiar people of the tribe of israel these are not gentiles they are not gentiles and these will not this is not the church this is not the church the church is gone in the rapture already and these are not the seventh day adventists you know what the seven day adventists say when they reach chapter seven of revelation they say there you are there you are this is a seven day adventist because they are the people that are keeping the sabbath and when this devastation will come they believe that everybody will go through that great tribulation but then the people that are keeping the sabbath they will not go through the final sin and then god will say hold it stop it right now let's seal the seven day adventist people until they are sealed the rest of the probably the rest of the calamities will not continue there's a problem here now because the seven day adventist people they are more than one forty four thousand. so which of them will be sealed and these are not the jehovah's witnesses in the early years of the jehovah's witnesses their doctrine was that one forty four thousand that will be sealed they are the Jehovah's Witnesses. At that time, they were not up to 144,000. So, they were trying to evangelize and distributing the watch, the watch tower, distributing their wake magazine and all that, doing a lot of evangelistic work. And eventually, they reached 144,000. They say, aha, uh -huh, now the Lord will come. And when the Lord comes, he will seal the, all the Jehovah's Witnesses. How many of them? 144,000. And then the end has come for the rest of the world. And then Jesus had not come. And he kept on evangelizing. And the number went beyond 144,000. Then there was confusion. Now, what are we going to do now? Because we are more than 144,000. And we say that all the Jehovah's Witnesses, they represent the 144,000. So somebody very sharp and very clever, he came out and said, Aha, uh -huh, we have discovered something. It's not all the Jehovah's Witnesses that will be sealed. It's the overcomers among the Jehovah's Witnesses. And those overcomers, their number will be 144,000. Are you going to be one of those overcomers? The more magazine you sell, the more doors you knock, and the more people you talk to, God will record you as one of those overcomers, will be one of the 144,000. That's why you find those people running about. They are trying and they are sweating. They are going up and down, saved by works, not by grace. And they are trying their best so that they can be numbered among the 144,000. I pity those people, they'll be so disappointed because these are Jewish people of the tribe of this, of the tribe of that, of the tribe of that. 12,000 times 12, that's 144,000. They're Jews all together. And that's the reason why you need to study the Bible. These are Jewish people that the Lord will seal for protection. Now, what's a seal? A seal is like a stamp, a symbol or device bearing the name of the owner which could be stamped upon someone or upon something it was customary in the east to brand the name of the master on the forehead of a slave this seal on each of the 144,000 jewish servants of god will be conspicuous and prominent engraved on their foreheads as a token of divine ownership and a pledge of their protection preservation and safety the seal or the mark will be a proper designation of the fact that they are the true servants of God at that time. These sealed servants of God will be saved after the rapture of the church. Mark that. These 144,000 Jews will be saved after the rapture of the church. Because if they had been saved before the rapture, they would have been raptured together with the whole church. They, but they would have been saved before coming to chapter 7 because it is not the seal that saves them. It is the seal that sets them apart that because you are saved, because you believe on the Lord, because you realize the great tribulation has a purpose and it is to bring devastation and judgment upon Israel so that they can turn to the Lord. So you have turned to the Lord, you'll be sealed. That is the children of Israel. All those who are saved, the whole church, whether Jews or Gentiles, will have taken place, will have taken part in the rapture. That would have occurred in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 before the first seal was ever broken in chapter 6. But these now, they are to be saved and become the servants of God during the great tribulation period. They will be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. 
When it says the first fruits, that means other Israelites after them will still be saved during the Great Tribulation. But these ones, 144,000 Jews, they will be the initial group, initial group to be saved at the time of the Great Tribulation. As you look at the references that you have there on your outline, look at Second Timothy, for example, Second Timothy chapter 2. We're talking about the seal of the Lord because these will be sealed. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it tells us, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord knoweth them that are his. In the past, he knew the people that belonged to him. And in the present, he knows the people that belongs to him. And then in the future, he will know the people that belong to him. He says, the Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. And let's go to Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 1. These people that are sealed. Revelation chapter 14 verse 1. And as, as and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the, on, on the Mount Zion. And with him an hundred forty and four thousand. Having his name, his father's name written in their foreheads. That's the seal. The father's name written on their foreheads. Heads. It's like when you have um, a kind of a stamp, and that stamp, um, in our own case now we use rubber stamp, and then when you put it on, on some liquid that has some color, and then you put it on paper, you'll be able to see the mark of that rubber stamp. But at that time, there'll be a supernatural way in which the Almighty God Himself will mark the people that belong to Him among the Jewish people. What's the, what's the reason why they will be sealed? It says, don't hurt them. Don't hurt the earth, don't hurt the sea, and don't hurt the trees, and don't hurt anything, anyone, until these people are sealed. In Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, reading from verse 3. From verse 3, this is another thing that will happen when the trumpets begin to blow. In verse 3, it says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth, have power and it was commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the field of the of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of god in their foreheads that is the spiritual demonic um, scorpions that will come out at that time referred to as locusts they will be stinking men and they will be causing terrible pain upon men and women children everybody but the people the jewish people that have the seal of god the scorpion will not be able to touch them in verse 5 and to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them because of that suffering that will come upon the people at that time that's the reason why these people were sealed at that time is this the first time when the jewish people will have that concept that understanding of being sealed to be preserved from the judgment of god no not at all if you go back to ezekiel chapter 9 you will see when the lord revealed the vision unto ezekiel that judgment was coming upon the people that were worshiping idols that went away from the lord and deserved all those evil things all those idols of gold and all the evil things they were doing but that the people of god that were crying that were sighing that were mourning because of the because of the corruption in the land the lord said they should be sealed first in ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, that cry, that mourn, that are sorrowful, that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. The Lord said in this vision to Ezekiel, he said, as uh, these people that are having the ink on, if you read from verse 1, as they were directed that you will seal, you will mark upon their foreheads the people that were sorrowful because of the sins that they saw. In verse 5, and to the others he said in my hearing, 
go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly both young and old, both old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So then you understand that the people that love the Lord, they are the people that will be sealed. And referring to the time of the great revelation once again in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, we're looking at verse 16. It says then, They that feared the Lord spake of one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him, then shall ye return and descend between the righteous and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not for behold in chapter 4 verse 1 for behold the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud ye all that do wickedly shall, uh, shall, be, shall be stubble and the day that cometh shall burn them up says the Lord of hosts that it shall not it shall leave them neither root nor branch but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in swings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. It's saying that during the time of the great tribulation, many of the people will suffer. But these 144,000 Jews, they'll be preserved. They'll be protected because they'll be sealed with the mark of the Lord in their forehead. Before I go away from that uh, point one, do you know that even today, God does that same thing in a spiritual way. Even in this dispensation, he preserves his own. If you are a child of God and there is a calamity in the world, there is wrath in the world, there is judgment in the world, and people are dying here and there, you don't have to be afraid because you are different. You may not see the mark, but he sets his mark upon you. And he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And he will not allow the calamities of this world to touch you because you are protected and you are preserved. And you are sealed by the sign of the the people that belong to the Lord in uh, Psalm 105. Psalm 105, I'm reading from verse 13. When they went from one nation to another, and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, nor do harm, nor do my prophet, and do my prophets no harm. That tells us then that it is not the first time that God will reveal that when he has his own, he protects them. He preserves them. He cares for them. And he will not allow the calamities coming upon the people of the world to come upon his own. In Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2. I'm reading there in verse 5. For I, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. In verse 8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory as he sent me unto the nations that spoiled you, for he that touched you touches the apple of his eye. He protects his own. And that's what he did for Paul the Apostle. And he assured Paul the Apostle to go on in the ministry because nobody will be able to hurt him. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 18 verse 9. Acts chapter 18 verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. If you are marked by the blood of the Lamb, what a great mark. As the redeemed of the Lord, as a child of God. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The Lord will protect you. I come to point number two, the selection of particular groups of Jehovah's servants. Jehovah's servants. I didn't say Jehovah's witnesses. I said what? 
Jehovah's servants. That is, these Jews, 144,000 of them, that the Lord himself will select and he will preserve. I come back to Revelation chapter 7, and I'm reading to you from verse 4. And I had the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed and 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. You wonder why some people can miss the point here. That it says it's for the children of Israel. These are not Gentiles. If you're going to learn about the Gentiles, you are not going to learn about the Gentiles from verse 9. But from this verse 4 to verse 8, it's talking about the children of Israel. Now read carefully. Verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah. 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of God was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Asa was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed, 12,000. And of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph was sealed, 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. Uh, can, can you see the, the people that were sealed here? As you read this in verse 5, you have Judah, Reuben, God, 3. In verse 6, you have Asa, and you have Nathalim, and you have Manasseh, 3. And in the verse 7, you have Simeon, and you have Levi, and you have Issachar, another 3. And in verse 8, you have Zebulon, you have Joseph, you have Benjamin, another 3. And you count 5, 6, 7, 8, that's 4. And 4 times 3, that's 12. 12,000 times 12, that's 144,000. And there's nothing you can add to this in this group. And there's nothing you can take away from this. You cannot add a denomination here. You cannot add any Gentile here. You cannot add any European, any American here. You cannot add any other group here because these are just 12 tribes. And 12 tribes times 12,000 each, you have 144,000. 12,000 from each one of the tribes of the children of Israel are sealed. And these are just the first fruits. Now, I've been using that language, first fruits, and you wonder, am I introducing that by myself? Where did I get the first fruits? Please come to Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, we're looking at it from verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, uh, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder and I heard the voice of harpers happening with their harps and they sang a new, and they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four bees and, and the elders and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth and it says they are they, they are they which are not defiled with women for they are virgins these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth they are the redeemed from the of men from among men being the first fruits being the first fruits, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was no girl. And it says, For they are without fault before the throne of God. They are the first fruits. Now, what does it mean when it says the first fruits? You see, these uh, people, the Israelites were farmers. And when the farmers planted in those days, when they started in their planting, the first week they will plant here. Second week they will plant here. Third week they will plant here until they finish all the planting. And then the rain will come, the former rain and the latter rain. Come upon the fruit to make the fruit to be ripe and eventually when it gets ripe guess what which one will get ripened first it will be the one that was first planted and then they will go to the first one that was planted in the first week and then they will bring it in that will be the first fruits of their farm when they harvest that they harvest that separately they harvest that first because it was planted first and it got ripened first, the first fruits. And then after that, they'll go back to harvest the rest. These 144,000 Jews, they're the first fruits of the harvest that will come. These are not the total because all Israel shall still be saved. And there are more than 144,000. You can see that compared with the whole number of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Reuben or the rest of the tribes, the number of those selected and sealed 
is very small indeed. At the time of the sealing, comparatively, comparatively few Jews, few Israelites are saved, are redeemed, are righteous and pure, while the vast proportion are yet not saved. Those who are not sealed will not be protected from the trumpet blast, the trumpet judgment, the fury of the judgments that will come, which will come at the opening of the seventh seal. But now, as you look at all this, there's something you need to understand in chapter 7 of Revelation. Look at this in chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 verse 5. And the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Judah was sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Reuben was sealed 12,000. Wait a minute. Who is the firstborn? Reuben. Judah was not the firstborn. How is it that Judah came first instead of Reuben? The tribe of Judah was named first instead of the, the tribe of Reuben because Reuben's birthright was taken away from him. For as much as de he defiled his father's bed. And you will see how Jacob spoke about that. In Genesis chapter 49 verses 3 and 4, he said, he went to my couch. He went to my bed. He defiled one of the wives of Jacob. And because of that, the first, the birthright was taken away from him. And then in the prophecy that came eventually, if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 2, Judah prevailed above his brethren. And of him came the chief ruler. The tribes of Dan and Ephraim are not mentioned. As you look at this, you look at all the tribes mentioned here, you'll not find the tribe of Dan and you'll not find the tribe of, uh, of Ephraim. You say you are taking two away from the 12 tribes of Israel. How is it then we still have 12? The reason is this. Whenever you are counting the tribes of the children of Israel, you generally don't count Levi. The reason you don't count Levi is because God said the Levites are mine. And he gave them a special responsibility and service in the house of God, in the tabernacle. Therefore, he said, I am the inheritance of the Levites. The Levites generally were not count counted. And then not only that, Joseph. You remember that uh, Joseph had two sons. One uh, of the sons, Ephraim. The other name is Manasseh. That is the other son. And when uh, Jacob was going to bless the children of Israel, he took the two sons of Joseph. He set Joseph apart. He said, your two children, they belong to me. And then he counted those two children of Joseph. He counted them as, uh, he counted them as two tribes. That's how they became 12. But over here now, you'll find that Ephraim is missing. But Joseph comes in. You find Dan missing. And then you find Levi re replacing Dan. Ephraim missing. And Joseph apart re uh, replacing him. And Manasseh is still there. That's how you still have the 12. Now, why is it that Dan, Dan was uh, taken away? Not Daniel, but Dan. The tribe of Dan. Why was it not there? Uh, you find the secret in, in Judges chapter in Judges chapter 18. Please open your Bible. In Judges chapter 18, we're looking at verse 13. In Judges chapter 18, verse 13, and the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and he and his sons were priests of the tribe of Dan unto the day of the captivity of the land. Uh, think about it. From the time of the judges. The time of the judges. Long, long ago. And then when the a great tribulation will appear, because Dan was the one that laid the precedence of leading Israel into idolatry. And because he became the mouthpiece for idolatry, because of that, when it came to this time, God brought the sin, the iniquity into remembrance. How oh, you need to be careful in your life what, that when the people of God are living righteous lives and holy lives, that you will not spearhead evil. You will not spearhead iniquity. You will not spearhead idolatry. You will not spearhead corruption to come into the midst of the people of God. Because Dan, because of idolatry that he spearheaded, his name is not here. The whole tribe, not here. When God sealed the people of God for protection. I about Ephraim. Ephraim had the same problem. If you look at Osea chapter 4, Osea chapter 4, reading from verse 17. Osea chapter 4, we're looking at verse 17. It tells us Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. That he is uh, Ephraim is joined unto idols. Let him alone. Before God said, let him alone, you remember what God had said about Ephraim. Ephraim is not Ephraim, my dear son. 
I've rebuked him, I've corrected him, I've chastised him, I've pulled him, I've dragged him, I've done everything. But yet, Ephraim will not yield. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20 is Ephraim my dear son. Is he a pleasant child? For since I speak against him, I do honestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. For I will surely have mercy upon him, says the Lord. The Lord wanted to have mercy upon him. And Ephraim was just, you know, shrugging the shoulder. Come, I will not come. I want to show you mercy. I don't need your mercy. I want to be compassionate on you. Go with your compassion. And I want to still forgive you. I want us to continue the normal relationship. No, I don't want that. And eventually God said, Ephraim is joined to idols. And I've tried to call him. I've tried to forgive him. I've tried to give him my grace. I've done everything I can do to bring him back into fellowship and relationship. But he will not let him alone. And then Ephraim thought it's all over. And now at this time, when the 12,000 seal from each tribe, Ephraim now is missing. You know, if you're doing something right there today, and then the people of God are pleading with you, and they're calling you, and they're visiting you, and they're, and, they're, and they're showing mercy to you, and they're saying, why are you doing like this? Why don't you change? Why don't you repent? Why don't you turn? Why don't you seek the face of the Lord? And say, leave me alone. Eventually, the mercy of God will leave you alone. And I will say, he is turned unto idols. He's made himself an idol. He's made himself will an idol. And because of that, let, let him alone. And then you are left alone. And when the time comes that your colleagues, other believers, brothers and sisters are receiving the blessing of God, then you are cast aside because it says you are joined to the idol of self. Let him alone. And that's the reason why Ephraim and Dan, that's why they are not part of the people of God here. These 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, are only the first fruits, as I've repeated over and over. They are not the whole harvest of the redeemed Israelites. Others are still to be saved among all the tribes of the children of Israel before the establishment of the millennial kingdom. None of the tribe of Dan are saved at the time of the sealing of the servants of God, the first fruit, so that uh, none of them was, was sealed. But before the millennium, Dan will be restored under uh, with other tribes and will be included in the millennial temple. You'll read that in Ezekiel uh, chapter 48. As you look at all these people that are sealed and you see the mercy of God that was shown to them, it gets you back again to the prophecy that had gone for the children of Israel. We're looking at Romans. Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, we're looking at verse 27. Romans chapter 9, verse 27. I say, also Christ concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as a sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make of will the Lord make upon the earth. In chapter eleven. Chapter 11, I'm reading to you from verse 1. I say then, as God cast away his people, the children of Israel, God forbid. For I, I also am an Israel, Paul said, of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which if he knew, what not, don't you know, what the scripture says of Elijah, Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I'm left alone and they seek my life but what says the answer of God unto him? I reserved to myself 7,000 men which have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at the present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That is for the children of Israel. There is an election and there is still a remnant that will be saved. In verse 25 of that same chapter 11 for I would not 
brethren, that ye Gentiles shall be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye shall be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. That is, until the time of the God's dealing in this dispensational way with the Gentiles, until that time be fulfilled, yes, Israel will remain in, in, in blindness. But after that time, when the rapture has taken place, then the Lord will remember Israel. And so all Israel, in verse 26, shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And uh, you find in Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 10. I'm reading to you there from verse 20. It's still talking about the fact that a part of Israel will be saved, that not all of them will be lost in perdition. In Isaiah chapter 10, reading from verse 20, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall, shall no more again stay upon him that smote them. That is, they will not be cringing and staying upon and relying upon the people that had oppressed them and smitten them but shall stay upon the Lord they will trust the Lord, they will have confidence in the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant shall of them shall return. A remnant of them shall return. Uh, please remember once again that all that we're reading now, uh, this is for the children of Israel, and it is still at the time to come. And you hear now that a group is selected, a part is selected. Uh, you are Wondering, am I one of the people to be selected? We're talking about the Jewish people. Today, this is the day of grace. There's no selection now. Anybody, whosoever will, may come now. This is the day of grace and the day of salvation. And salvation is available for whosoever will repent and believe the Lord. Don't get confused as we're reading all this because we're talking about the future. And this time has not come. The rapture has not taken place. In the future, at the time of that great tribulation, among the children of Israel, there will be selection, selection, selection. But for us today, for us today, there's no selection. You can come in. You can be saved. You can be born again. The mercy of God is available for whosoever will come now. Did you hear what John says in John chapter 3? John chapter 3, reading from verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever, you hear that? That's you. That's me. That's everybody here. That's everybody beyond here. That's everybody in this day, in this age, in this dispensation. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, there's no selection now. You can come. There's no selection now. You can be saved. There's no selection now. You can believe because it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, what if God has marked anyone down for destruction, for perdition? Nothing like that. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering towards word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, here we're told again about the whosoever. Acts chapter 2 verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou, even thou, even you will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, 
But the scripture says, Whosoever shall whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile at the present time, the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as we look at Revelation chapter 20, here the Lord Jesus Christ assures you in verse 17, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that hear us say, Come. And let him that the thirst come. And whosoever will, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So, at this present time now in the generation in which we are living, whosoever will may come. I come to point number three, salvation and purity of God's, of godly, justified saints. This 144,000 that we have read about of the tribe of Israel, what sets them apart? What makes them different from the rest of the Jewish people in their own time at their own dispensation? This is it, justified. This is it. They became saints and servants of the Lord. They believed on the Lord and they were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. What we believe today, they'll believe at that time. The, what the blood of Jesus does in our lives and our hearts today, it will do in their lives and their hearts at that time. Look at them again in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 verse 1. And I looked. And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And with him and hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers happening with their halves, that's musical instrument they were playing. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. Those are the living creatures we landed before, and the elders, representatives of the church that are redeemed, are raptured already in heaven and it says no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth these are they which are not defiled with women and it says they are virgins these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth these were the redeemed were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and unto the lamb in their mouth was no guile no deceit no deception no lying for they are without fault before the throne of God you'll find here there are some qualities given about them number one it says that they arch on their forehead the mark of the Lord the mark of the Lord that you'll find in verse 1, the latter part of verse 1, having his father's name written in their foreheads. How did that come about? Why did the Lord separate them, specialize them like that? To have the father's name stamped upon their head, reaching upon their head. I said it before just to remind you in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, go, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, that mourn, that are sorrowful, and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst there. Of. And the reason is because they were not happy that the people were dishonoring the, uh, the name of the Lord. They didn't go with the principle that many people go with, if you can't beat them, join them. That is, if those people are doing evil in our offices, if those people are giving bribes in our offices, if those people are corrupt and they are polluted, and you can't beat them, and you can't correct them, what do you do? Join them and become part of them. Because they will never change. These people made up their minds. They were so sorrowful that people were dishonoring the name of the Lord. Will not join them. Will not be part of them. Will be separate from them. And because they took their stand, that's why they were marked out as God's special people. And not only that, we have another thing about them. If you look at that Revelation chapter 14, and you look at the first part of verse, eight, of, uh, of verse 4, it says, These are they which were not defiled. Defiled with women, not defiled not defiled. You see, if the Lord is going to spare you, and is going to come to you as part of God's people that will escape the judgment of God, you know the characteristic you are going to have? Not defiled. The undefiled in the way. Look at Psalm 119. 
In Psalm 119, we're told about the people that will be spared from the judgment of the Lord. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the way of the Lord. If you want to have the mark of the Lord, so that the Lord will seal you and protect you and preserve you and will set you apart from the people of the world, so that when the devastation and destruction and calamities of judgment will come upon them, that God will spare you as part of his own. Be not defiled. Blessed happy, fortunate, at the undefiled in the way, who walk, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with their whole heart. And it says they also do no iniquity and they walk in his ways. You ask me, how can we remain undefiled? In this world in which we live, it tells us in verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. By taking heed therefore according to thy word. Verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. It's saying that now that you say you are a child of God, now that you say you are born again, you must be different. You will not allow the corruption of the world or the pollution of the world to become part of your lifestyle. That if you are children of God, if you are, if you actually been washed by the blood of the Lamb, you are told in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading there to you from verse 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, walk in love, in the love of God. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments, as Christ also has loved us, and he has given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor, but fornication, and all on cleanness and covetousness let it not be once named among you as become a saint be a saint be justified by faith in christ and be washed in the blood of the lamb and let the power of the spirit of god keep you keep you faithful neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks for this you know, that no armonger, adulterous man or woman, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater, has any part, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these sins cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And then he tells us, he says, be ye not therefore partakers with them. Don't join them. Don't join them. You see people backsliding? Don't join them. You see people committing sin? Don't join them. You see people that are careless with all that we learn and learn and learn. And yet there's no change in their lives and they persist in their sins. Don't join them. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable unto the lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them as you come back to revelation chapter 14 you'll find another quality of these people the one for the four thousand the people that are sealed and preserved and protected from the judgment of god and it says for their virgins and it says these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth that's following the lord every time following jesus day by day nothing can harm me anywhere i go because satan is moving all over the world but it says in jesus you are protection you are preservation because you are following the lord every time you live for jesus day after day and then he tells us again that they are the redeemed from among men because they are the first fruits unto god and unto the lamb redeemed what does that mean redeemed we're told in psalm 130 130 the last verse there in psalm 130 we're looking at verse 8 the redeemed of the earth redeemed what does that mean it says and it shall redeem israel from all his iniquities. All his iniquities. It means no sin remaining, no iniquity remaining, no evil remaining. He shall redeem Israel from all iniquity. How do we partake in that kind of redemption? How do we partake in the redemption of the Lord, the cleansing of the Lord? Titus tells us in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly 
righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us redeem us who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and as we look at that revelation chapter 14 verse 5 it says and in their mouth was no girl in their mouth was no girl and that's telling us something that if we're going to be among the redeemed of the lord in our mouths there'll be no girl there'll be no deception there'll be no lying you've confessed the lies of the past and the lord has forgiven you and now the lord gives you a clean life a righteous life and whatever the situation even if people will judge you as wrong even if they will punish you whatever they will do you make up your mind no girl no deceit no lie will come out of my mouth. In Psalm 32 verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Blessed is the man in unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile, there is no deceit. And if we are born again, what the Lord is telling us is to put away all guile. He tells us, wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies, and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that she may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you have tasted the grace of the Lord, then there will be no guile in your mouth. You are not to follow the lifestyle of the Lord Jesus Christ. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For even hereunto, were ye called? Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. What example has he left us? He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. He did not sin. There was no guile, no deceit, no lie, no deception found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. No retaliation. When he suffered, he threatened not be a Christian. Be a follower of Christ and follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes because he has laid the example. But he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And now he tells us in that same Revelation chapter 14, uh, the final quality about their lives in verse 5. And it says, for they are without fault, without fault before the throne of God, without fault. This is what the grace of God can do in your life and it will do it even from tonight in Jesus' name. That's why the Lord is telling us through Jude from verse 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost. That is, if you allow the Holy Ghost to be praying through you. That doesn't mean always speaking in tongues. Yes, sometimes speaking in tongues. At other times, so just allow the Spirit of God to lead you to prayer. And to lead you to what you are going to say in praying. And to make sure that you concentrate on how your life will be pure and holy and righteous. By the leading and direction and the control of the Holy Spirit. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto to eternal life and on some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh that is even when you go to evangelize or when you are relating with other people talking to other people you are trying to help them whatever fault they have whatever blemish they have whatever blame they have whatever iniquity they have don't allow that to splash on you don't allow that to affect you or to influence you now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever and everybody said uh, that's what the Lord has uh, 
given to us today, the Lord himself, he wants to make you faultless. He wants to cleanse you with the blood of the lamb. And then when the role is called up yonder, by the grace of God, you will be there. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I want to be there. I want to be there. I do not want anything to hinder me on that final day. All these people were reading about, this is the time of the great tribulation. The church would have gone before that time of the great tribulation. And if you are going to be part of the people of God, number one, you ought to be redeemed. Number two, you ought to be sanctified, sanctified, purified in your heart. Because it says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then all the rest of your life, you are following the Lord and following the Lord and following the Lord every step of the way. And you are asking yourself, what will Jesus do? What will Jesus do? And whatever Jesus will not do that, you will not do so that the Lord himself can preserve you in righteousness, in holiness and sanctification until the coming of the Lord. And when that day will come and the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and the saints of God shall be changed and he'll put on incorruption and he'll be incorruptible, you will go with them. Let that be your goal. Every day of your life, you are defiled in the way and all the life you live will be a life of righteousness and holiness unto the Lord. Be ready when the Lord will come.